Edie, thanks very much, and it's great to be back at the seventh future investment uh, initiative, of course. I was listening very carefully to the board discussion today in the speech of His Excellency Yasser al Rumayan, uh, and he talked about the new reality actually needing a new compass. I was thinking in the context of what has happened over the last three years, a compressed period of time with the COVID-19 pandemic, a huge investment by the global community to get us out of that pandemic. Supply chains were broken, they're getting mended today, but it resulted in high inflation, <coughs> high interest rates, and if that wasn't enough in the last three years, it's been compressed by a Russia-Ukraine conflict and what we see transpiring at the heart of the Middle East today. So the big question here now is, how do you maintain the investment mandate with this level of uncertainty? The board was a little bit negative on what 2024 is going to provide for us, but we're going to look at the world in a different way. If I'm sitting here from Saudi Arabia looking east to Asia or south to Africa, what are the opportunities that are on the table that can stay on track despite that uncertainty? Uh, let's give a nice warm welcome to the panel. It's an excellent diverse group. Thank you very, very much for joining us. I, I think I would be remiss, uh, Ms. Rafale, if I didn't start. And it's great that you assembled this group with uh, Turkey, India, Morocco, and Finland. Uh, and there's a lot of collaboration here at the crossroads of East and West with Saudi Arabia. But I would be remiss if I didn't start on the trends that we see today. Uh, some call it the table mountain where interest rates went up and they may plateau at this level for longer to squeeze inflation out of the system. Uh, we had the supply chains that we've talked about in the past broken, but they are mending. But the growth here in Saudi Arabia is 8.7%. So how do you shape that narrative with the trends that are the headwinds that are facing the world today? And I think this is a great uh, point for the rest of the panel, if we can cover that off. Your biggest concerns and how do you combat them? Well, thank you, John, for uh, the introduction and uh, for moderating, and it's good to be here. Congratulations uh, to Yasser and uh, Richard for a great uh, FII again. Well done. And it's good to be with my uh, colleagues from around the world on this uh, investment mandate panel. Uh, as already mentioned a number of times today, indeed there are many headwinds. Uh, you mentioned interest rates, but we have supply chain disruptions. We have scarcity of materials related to supply chains. We have, of course, uh, the remnants of the pandemic and the countries that have been hurt from the pandemic. Uh, we have uh, still inflation and the remnants of the energy crisis. Uh, and we see that maybe most acutely in Europe, where, uh, where energy <coughs> cost and even availability uh, is in question. Uh, and in Saudi Arabia, I believe many of these challenges actually play to our strengths. Uh, the kingdom uh, has one of the lowest cost of capital, if you consider our risk premium uh, on borrowing. The kingdom is uh, quite competitive. Our credit rating is good. I think investors around the world look around and what do they want? They want a stable country politically, uh, economically. Uh, from a monetary standpoint, a currency that's pegged to the US, US dollar for uh, a long, long time, and is going to continue to be uh, to be that way. Our investment thesis is uh, set for the long term. We're not fluctuating from year to year. We have co-investors in Saudi Arabia that are willing to invest. I think another phenomena that we've seen globally is that many of the multinational investors are choosing capital efficiency while they continue to grow their business. So many companies, and uh, if you think of hospitality, uh, are going with an asset light strategy. Many companies increasingly in manufacturing are also going with contract manufacturing. Uh, and when companies are going to a new jurisdiction, in addition to all of the stability issues I mentioned, they would rather have co-investors from the local economy who put a significant part of the capital. In Saudi Arabia, you can tick all of these boxes. You can tick all of these boxes because in addition to the fundamental stabilities that we have, in addition 
to the long-term investment uh, equity story and thesis, we have, we have also strong investors. We have strong developmental banks in Saudi Arabia that can lend at very low interest rate that reduces the average cost of capital. And therefore, while we're still impacted by sustained interest rates, and we hope they're not sustained for too long, we hope that tabletop comes back down sooner rather than later. But while it's, it's up, I think it presents investors with an opportunity in Saudi Arabia that is perhaps better than, than uh, many other competing locations. Uh, we'll come back to your national investment strategy, and there was a tripling of FDI in a 10-year window going to 2021, and your mandate now is to make sure it's diversified in the non-oil growth we're seeing, but I'll do that in the second round. Um, Barak uh, Dagliogu, nice to have you here from the investment office uh, in the president's office, and talk about headwinds because you're looking to perhaps raise interest rates up to 35% now to combat inflation, and uh, Mehmet Simsek, the Minister of Finance, made it very clear uh, we're going to be very orthodox in this approach to restore confidence. Uh, you've been a huge haven for FDI over the last 20 years. It's more than $250 billion. Sure. In this environment, when inflation's high and we have the central bank and the Ministry of Finance stabilizing matters, what are you focusing on then for the next stage of growth? Oh. Thank you for the question, and I would like to thank all organizers for uh, you know, gathering uh, us uh, in this special uh, occasion. So, of course, the monetary stability and the price stability uh, or macro you know, indicators you know, should be stable for such decision-making process. Uh, but more importantly, for the foreign direct investment you know, uh, appetite, uh, we focus on some other uh, topics. You know, uh, we, we accept that you know, uh, the stabilization should be there, and we are taking the necessary steps. So, as the country, with what we are focusing on is especially I'm not going to speak about the sustainability. I mean, this is the core of the all strategies for all investment policies. But as a two main topic, we are focusing on the global uh, supply chain restructuring. So as you mentioned, Turkey has become a kind of you know, regional hub for multinationals. And you know, Turkish uh, companies are also part of this ecosystem. And we know that foreign direct investors are the leaders of you know, integration to the global value chain. So, so our focus is to make sure that companies in Turkey, both international and locals, uh, because when you establish a company in Turkey, you are deemed as a Turkish company. So we are trying to make sure that they are integrated with the global value chains and they are moving up the value chain. Mm. So this is the one aspect of the supply chain issue. Secondly, you know, since we invested heavily in our infrastructure and superstructure in the last two decades under the leadership of President Erdogan, uh, we have quite advantageous position for you know, having a more central role in the supply chain you know, uh, resiliency. So especially in the post-COVID era, the export growth of Turkey was uh, double digit. You know, for one year it was 35%, the next year it was more than 20%, so the, the exports are growing rapidly. More importantly, the second topic I think you know, I, I like emphasizing <coughs> on that, the local entrepreneurship, especially the technology entrepreneurship. This is I think, you know, creating a competitive edge for uh, Turkey. I mean, for the, you know, the investment perspective, we all know that technology is the, I mean, the heart of the new economy. And especially for the foreign direct investors, those uh, startups are becoming a major driver of the FDI inflows to the country. Just to give you numbers and to close it, back in two, uh, ten, uh, 10 years ago, the, you know, the early stage investments to those technology you know, area was like just double digits, million dollars. I mean, five years ago, it grew to triple-digit million dollars, and as of the last two, two years, it is more than billion dollars, just at the early stage. So while they are making, making those exits and etc., it, it is becoming like a you know, snowball. It's getting bigger and bigger. And uh, I, you know, in the last two years, those technology startups were driver of the one-third of FDI inflows to the country. Mm. Is, it so the supply raise, chain, is it difficult to raise money in Turkey now? It's so easy. I mean, all the international venture capitals are quite active. And throughout time, we developed our own capital market. I mean, we introduced reg uh, regulation. It is in line with the European Alternative Direct Investment uh, Directorate. So it is quite a uh, liberal uh, environment, let's say. So I can uh, say that, you know, the supply chain uh, restructuring and the technology entrepreneurship is the main driver of the investments currently. Okay, good. Thanks very much. Uh, Payush Goyal, I was... <coughs> I was trying to think of the best way to frame your uh, position on the panel today. I would say the bell of the ball, right? Because <laughs> you have a, a consumer market of 1.4 billion, but you have the presidency in 2023 of the G20. You said something very prescient to me in the green room behind stage. If we focus too much on the negative and the, the conflict here in the region 
Russia, Ukraine, and we don't look for solutions, uh, it becomes a self-perpetuating prophecy, right? That you could spiral down. Uh, but you're growing well right now, and you're looking at key sectors to pull in investment. Textiles, you've had a major car manufacturing facility. Uh, Japanese steel makers have come in. Are they seeing the opportunity now of the, the new India, if you will, in this reform-minded uh, process? Thank you, John, and thank you, FII, for this opportunity. India traditionally has gone through a long phase of high inflation and high interest rates. It's only in the last decade that we've finally been able to rein in inflation. Our average of the last 10 years would be about 4.5% as against double-digit inflation barely 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Therefore, a much more stable political environment, decisive leadership, at the same time, a lot of regulatory certainty that we've bought in over the last 10 years has made India a very attractive investment destination. We have over the last 10 years focused on a three-pronged strategy. On the one hand, we set our basic fundamentals of the economy right, whether it's uh, getting growth on track, lower inflation, lower interest rates, high foreign exchange reserves, ensured that uh, tax rates remain low. All the building blocks of uh, a good emerging economy where investors feel comfortable. On the other hand, we leveraged our 1.4 billion people market and a growing market at that. People whose basic needs have all been taken care of. So today, food, clothing, shelter, education, healthcare, access to digital technology, financial inclusion, these are all areas over the last 10 years where we've saturated the entire population. We've made sure everybody has these basic uh, needs that drive human uh, work. And on the third, we focus a lot on infrastructure investments, which has given us lower logistics costs, better competitiveness, both for the domestic and the international consumer. On this three-pronged approach, we believe India will continue to be the fastest growing large economy. Mm. Uh, we heard the figures of Saudi Arabia, very impressive. I wish we had a little bit more pools of oil in our country. Uh, but we are leveraging our managerial talent, we are leveraging the skill sets of our people, the huge demographic dividend, an under 30 population, our average age is under 30, expected to be under 30 for the next 30 years, and we hope to add a $30 trillion more to the Indian GDP in less than 30 years from now. So that's the India story that's attracting investments, that that's attracting people from all over the world who see that coupled with the domestic demand, when we look at our competitiveness on the international stage, India is the place to be. Okay, very good, interesting. Mr. Minister Jazuli, it's great to have you, and uh, we have to commend the government and the IMF and World Bank for holding the, the meetings there, the fall meetings, after such a shock to your economy. Uh, this is an economy that's been diversifying for the last 15 years under the present king uh, and moved into renewable energy, has moved into manufacturing, has now pulled in some IT investment as well. But you wanted to talk about equity, and it's something that uh, the CEO of the FII Institute brought up here, uh, equity in society, right, in a more humble and cooperative society. You said this is a key point for you now when you're trying to attract investment into Morocco. Explain why. Sure, thank you, thank you, John, and then thank you, Richard and FII, uh, for inviting me. Uh, actually, I'd, I'd like to come back to the, to the compass, yeah. not only because it's, uh, it's the topic of uh, this uh, seventh uh, FII, but uh, uh, also because uh, now the, the world, where, where the world is uh, facing uh, a crisis of leadership, uh, uh, we have the, the chance uh, in the Kingdom of Morocco, like uh, here in the Kingdom of so Saudi Arabia, to have leaders and leadership. And uh, in Morocco, our, our compass is our King, His Majesty the King, who gives us uh, the uh, uh, right vision, a very clear vision about what we are doing now. And it's based on, on two main pillars. 
The first one is a social pillar. And it's very important uh, to, to, to focus on what we are doing on the social state, uh, social protection, universal uh, healthcare coverage, education, etc. So that's the first pillar that we have to finance with the second pillar, which is growth, and growth coming from investment. Uh, if you look at the, the investment rate in Morocco, uh, it's uh, around 28% of the GDP, which is really higher than the average uh, OCDE uh, countries, which is 22%. 28%, it's because for the last 20 years, we have built a lot around infrastructures, uh, uh, like ports, uh, uh, highways, uh, high-speed train, uh, uh, renewables, etc. Uh, so now it's time to shift from uh, uh, public investing to private investing. Actually, we are, we are two-thirds public, one-third uh, private. And we want to, to move this ratio by 2035 mm. to two-thirds private, one-third public. Mm. And hopefully, there's a Moroccan momentum now, and uh, it's happening thanks to, of course, the, the infrastructure I was talking about, but uh, uh, also the, the young and talented people. Uh, the average uh, age in Morocco is 29, when in Europe it's 43. Uh, we have also uh, affordable, uh, available renewables, uh, and we have also a market. We are, of course, 40 million consumers, but we are bigger than India, in terms of consumer, as we have free trade agreements, we have 2.5 billion uh, consumer thanks to the uh, 50 plus free trade agreements th th that we are having. So uh, we are focusing on those investments and uh, we have some success stories, mainly in automotive. We are the first uh, producer, car producer in Africa, first exporter to Europe, and uh, also in automotive. Uh, there's no single uh, plane that flies in the sky that doesn't have a part made in Morocco. So those success stories will help us investing more in, in uh, pr private investment like uh, uh, EV batteries or the whole value chain of EV batteries or the green hydrogen as well. Uh, so, of course, uh, everything is uh, welcome to, to finance those huge projects uh, in billions in Morocco. Yeah, you did do these building blocks of infrastructure, as you said, in the trade agreements. Uh, we'll circle back about collaboration with Portugal and Spain. We had Johnny Infantino with the FIFA World Cup. We should talk about the influence that could have on your economy as well. Um, Tablo, uh, Minister Tablo, it's great to have yeah. you, by the way. Yeah. And I don't want to get into geopolitics here, but I think it's worth noting there's a profound shift in your foreign policy uh, and yeah, NATO membership in 2023 because of the yeah. Russia-Ukraine conflict. But if I look at the numbers, uh, your exports to the United States are up about 38% in the last three years. Uh, does this security apparatus uh, change the dynamics in Finland and allow you to push out at a greater scale forest products, your IT skills, uh, refined uh, energy products as well, and you're also making an energy transition? But the, the, what does that impact have of that security umbrella, would you suggest? Oh, well, that's a broad question. It's. Uh true that we are now uh, uh, members of NATO and this, uh, pr we are uh, providers of uh, security to our uh, Nordic Baltic region of the Europe. So we are security providers and this uh, obviously leads to more st stab stable uh, investment uh, ground for, for uh, outbound and inbound investments. Uh, USA is uh, now our uh, biggest trading partner among uh, of course, some of the European countries, but we need, we're really uh, looking forward to diver diversifying the supply chains more. So the, in this geopolitical time, the diversification of supply chain is uh, one of the top priorities. So that's where I think Saudi Arabia comes in place also as a very in, uh, important uh, partner in this region. So we are uh, doing uh, a lot to work to, uh, to, to, uh, to get the supply chains work perfectly and you know we need the logistics, we need the seaways, the trade routes open oh. to keep on the economy uh, boosting. And we have a pretty, uh, pretty successful companies here already like Kone, uh, Kone Nokia, Wärtsilä and our companies are pretty uh, competitive in the clean tech uh, energy perspective. And that's partly because of our society, like you mentioned, we 
uh, we have uh, invested heavily to the, uh, to the climate uh, uh, acts. So uh, we are already our electricity at nine, is 90 percentage uh, fossil free. So we are, uh, we are uh, uh, going to carbon neutrality in uh, 2035, but we are doing this, especially with my new government, we are doing it so that we secure the businesses' competitiveness and speak with the uh, businesses directly. And also this makes it sure that we ensure the uh, people's purchasing power in the times of inflation. That's the big topic here. You, you mentioned the supply chains with uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. It's interesting that Finland and Saudi Arabia would be collaborating. What do you hope to get out of it? And then I'll come to Minister of Holland. Uh, well, right now we are, of course, looking for the areas in, in uh, clean tech products. But of also our strategy is to look for, for the mid-sized companies to, uh, at, to achieve new growth markets. So our, our uh, more like the mid-sized companies are looking routes and I'm doing the trade promotion with them now all over the world but we are choosing strategically the countries from each continent that we work a little bit more specifically. Those would be like in this region, Saudi Arabia, for example, but uh, in Asia, they would be, for example, Japan, because they have a NATO affiliation. So we have a strategic uh, mindset. Yeah. Good. Uh, I think I would be uh, yeah. overlooking a, a quite a major trend that came out of the G20, and that's the India, Middle East, uh, European corridor. And if I think about this panel, you all would be involved, right? Uh, one would say, cynically, it's a counterbalance to the Belt and Road Initiative, which is now uh, 10 years old. But what is the opportunity that comes with it? I'll ask Minister Alfale and then go to Mr. Goyal and then come back to Turkey, please. Uh, what, what do you see as an outcome of that? And can you have good relations with China and then ask you'll develop an alternative road to, to Europe here for South Asia, the Middle East, and Europe? Well, John, I don't see it as a, a substitute, and certainly not a counter in any way. We're, uh, our relationship with China and our uh, attempts to find a place to play within the Belt and Road have continued, in fact, have accelerated over the last year. In this hall, we had an Arab-Chinese conference that Richard again organized for us a few months ago, and it was a huge success and Chinese investments is incoming into the region and certainly to Saudi Arabia. And we see, however, uh, this IMEC initiative uh, as a realization of a number of trends. And certainly it's a realization of His Royal Highness the Crown Prince vision. And I think it's a validation of the soundness of Vision 2030. One of the anchor themes of Vision 2030 is capitalizing, not just for the kingdom, but for the rest of the world, our unique location as a crossroads between Asia, Africa, and Europe, and as a hub for trade and connectivity. And connectivity is no longer simply in the important trade of goods, but it's also in the trade of services, people travel, <coughs> as well as, of course, the ever more important digital uh, connectivity. Uh, IMEC also is a realization of the hard fact we learned from to accept. So regionalization has emerged as a theme, and you have this regionalization theme being activated through IMEC, where a very large region indeed, stretching from South Asia, India, through the Middle East, GCC countries, uh, through Turkey, of course, Greece, and, uh, and, and uh, to the EU. Uh, and of course, it brings together, I think if you look at the countries around this, from what we heard around, around the panel, we're all like-minded in our business orientation and the relationship we have between government and the private sector in terms of how we provide the investors, owners of capital, corporates that have IP, that have markets, that have brands, places to invest comfortably knowing that they are going to be protected uh, and looked after. So it threads together these countries that are strategically aligned uh, and, uh, uh, and like-minded. It addresses emerging sectors 
that the world, no matter what the risks and cost of doing business, some sectors, and perhaps I should have said this to answer your first question, some sectors have to grow and have to grow rapidly. So uh, greening uh, of uh, energy consumption, greening of manufacturing, greening of logistics, which involves bringing in new fuels uh, and uh, electrification as part of that green. So connecting countries like India and Saudi Arabia, despite the distance and the depth of the oceans, connecting through submarine cables is something that we're very seriously considering, just as we're considering connecting with Europe, not only on the data cable that has been already set in construction with Europe through uh, Cyprus and, uh, and Greece, but also through electrification. But bringing hydrogen, shipped in its different way, maritime, ports that are linked together through, uh, through technology, and then, of course, through the data cables I mentioned, unleashing the connectivity uh, of, uh, of data, analytics, uh, AI, as well as uh, travel and tourism. Uh, so it, I think, I think it, uh, it, it uh, brings, it ticks all of those boxes and I think it's, uh, it's good for, uh, for the world and it's not uh, certainly going back to your thesis in the beginning of the question, it's not way it's meant to uh, counter any other global initiative. Good. Uh, the G20 is a, a difficult structure, as you know, Minister Goyal. Uh, sometimes you don't get anything out of it, but this is a very solid communique. Uh, we have this corridor set up. Uh, how does India straddle this investment horizon, right? Because you haven't expanded BRICS to 11 just before the G20. Uh, so if I look at it, it seems like a massive complexity. How do you create opportunity out of this complexity that we're faced today when it applies to investment? John, I think it's all about trust. The operative word here is how much do we trust each other? Mm. And what Prime Minister Modi has been successful in doing is building up trusted friendships and partnerships with countries across the world. During the G20 presidency, there were very, very complex situations, concerns around getting an outcome document, particularly since the war continued in uh, Ukraine, the conflict with Russia. But India's stand has been very consistent that dialogue and diplomacy is the only way forward. This certainly is not an era of war. And I think that resonates with the rest of the world on both sides. And what Prime Minister Modi was able to do was generate the confidence amongst all the member countries of the G20 now the expanded G20, we are really proud to have the African Union as a member of the G20, reflecting the voice of a large section of humanity, which was left out earlier. And I think uh, the fact that everybody was very keen to find solutions to the problems of the world, rather than just go around a conflict or go around a problem statement, Focusing on the positives, focusing on the good that humanity can benefit from out of the G20 helped come up with 112 outcomes and complete consensus. There was absolutely no disagreement on any paragraph. And uh, probably one of the most successful G20s which went around the country, which saw India blossoming from the old times into an emerging new uh, powerhouse, a country that's coming out of the shadows of the past, embracing modernity, embracing technology, in fact, at the forefront of technology today. And I think uh, we really are grateful to all the members of the G20 for their positivity in wanting to support the Indian G20 presidency and coming up with significant outcomes, which we hope uh, will go forward the Brazilian presidency has committed to take forward many of these initiatives. All our member countries and friends are, let's say, conspiring to make the world a better place to live in. Good. Uh, in that spirit, we have COP28 coming up in uh, Dubai in less than uh, seven weeks. And 
three of our members of this panel said I need to talk about the transition and the opportunities uh, that they present. Uh, Minister Afale talked about the development of blue and green hydrogen in the country here. Uh, you have been in Turkey uh, an amazing energy hub, uh, and you see opportunity here because of the young workforce to advance this process now. What are the major projects that you're working on, would you say, Barak? Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, of course, on the uh, energy policy side throughout the you know, last two decades, we developed an energy market which is liberal, transparent, and integrationally integrated, and we also have a free uh, I mean, liberal uh, energy exchange market. So currently, we have a kind of you know, installed electricity generation capacity of 100 gigawatts, and 55% is coming from renewables. So we have some bases. Mm -hmm. So um, the wind uh, for solar, we have already some bases. And throughout those you know, uh, decades, uh, we also implemented policies to make sure that the manufacturing of those equipment are also localized. And uh, for the next, I mean, the future uh, I mean, agenda, we have definitely uh, green hydrogen and green ammonia, and uh, definitely uh, the SMR technologies, so for the nuclear, you know, small and uh, medium-sized uh, reactors. On the battery sto uh, energy storage side, I think uh, to, to have more uh, renewable capacity, you must have base load or uh, uh, storage capacity, and uh, we have been uh, investing in the uh, factories for the batteries, and you know, we have some projects on the hydraulic storage, and if you consider hydrogen as a way of storing the energy, we have uh, that as well. So, but you know, uh, what we see, these you know, ESG or you know, sustainability is not a solo game. So we are much more focusing on the international collaborations. Actually, which you know, brings me to the, the, the more comprehensive concept. Since we are talking about the new compass here, uh, thanks to Richard and you know, his uh, colleagues, we have to recalibrate our uh, compasses. So uh, we cannot achieve those sustainability targets by you know, just countries, single countries alone. And I would like to give one example with you know, our relations with Saudi, for example. So in the last recent uh, decade with MISA, we have been collaborating on you know, creating synergies between two countries. They also have some ambitious targets for the green energy and localization of the manufacturing of the equipment. We have some bases and uh, we are working on such collaboration areas. And it is not just limited to energy. So we can you know, expand it to the uh, tourism investments uh, or some other manufacturing investments. So our focus you know, is investment decision makers or practitioners, uh, we have to focus on not the competition only, because traditionally we have been competing on you know, uh, those you know, the projects to get them to the countries, but we have to focus on the new complementary areas. In my opinion, in this fragile, you know, volatile global environment, the companies, investors, I mean, it can be corporate, multinational, sovereign wealth funds, fund managers, they are looking for wider regions of economic stability. And as the decision makers, we have to focus on the areas that how we can grow the bilateral investments and how we can you know, enable a larger economic uh, stability area. So this should be our uh, new compass in our opinion, and it shouldn't be limited to just energy. Yeah, it's well, also the, the Finnish minister brought up the same thing. We have to look for commonalities for uh, partnerships, which is an interesting theme emerging from the panel that I was not expecting. Mr. Jazuli, you talked about the development of wind and solar in Morocco. Uh, Mr. Ofala and I had a chance to talk about the pipeline network that's being built, hopefully completed, like the Trans-Saharan, uh, right, that would come through Morocco into Europe for natural gas from Africa. So you're strategic, very much like Turkey, as an energy hub. But you're also pointing to the future in electrification, particularly for battery development here. Uh, that's quite unique for Morocco to be focused on that area. Is that an extension of the work you've done in the automobile sector? Actually, it's, uh, once again, it's a matter of compass, leadership. Uh, Fifteen years ago, there was a bet in Morocco, uh, a bet on renewables uh, for ecological reasons, of course, but also for economic uh, reasons. We don't have any fossil fuels uh, energy. So we, we, we uh, invested a lot uh, in renewables. Uh, so we have today uh, almost 40% of our uh, energy mix coming from renewables, and we are targeting 50% by 2030. Uh, this is not because uh, we have the best air radiation, uh, sun air radiation, or best uh, wind exposure, but because we have the best combination of both. And today it's very important when you need intermittence, when you need regularity, it's important that you have a the, the very good combination between boats. That's the reason why a lot of uh, people are now looking at Morocco 
uh, and mainly when uh, you are uh, now moving the, the, the value chain from Asia and close to Europe uh, uh, after what's happening in, in, in Ukraine, uh, we, we need, and Europe is decarbonizing, so we need to have those uh, 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 renewables and uh, we are now betting a lot on uh, EV batteries, uh, for instance, uh, because they need the renewables uh, as we are investing a lot in green hydrogen. Uh, in EV batteries, uh, uh, we have commitments for uh, like uh, more than $40 billion dollars in the, the different uh, uh, parts of the value chain of the, the, the EV battery, because as you know, there are a lot uh, of parts in the EV battery. Uh, so we are now uh, working on, on this uh, very important sector, as well as the green uh, hydrogen, because we are one of the main off-takers of green ammonia, as we have uh, the phosphate. So to, 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 if, if you uh, mix the phosphate uh, with the green ammonia, then you can feed the planet. So uh, at the same time, we are working uh, uh, to link Morocco with the Europe, uh, mainly UK, uh, with the huge uh, uh, HVDC wire. It's uh, high voltage wires that can link Morocco to, to, to UK. So there are a lot of investment in, in green hydrogen. Uh, we can count uh, uh, 10 times what I, I said about EV battery, almost $400 billion dollars in investment in, uh, uh, in green hydrogen. So, of course, uh, there, there's a room for project finance, there's a room for, from private in, in equity and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, we'll be more than happy to come again and uh, uh, talk about the success stories. Thank you very much. We only have two and a half minutes left, and I think we should address uh, the elephant in the room. I don't want to sit down for FII number eight in the autumn of 2024 and say, wow, you guys didn't take out that compass and how to navigate the disruption. Uh, we have a major conflict in the Middle East. We've been living with turmoil for, what, over 20 months now with Russia, Ukraine. Minister Afali, do you want to wrap up of how do you take the compass out and navigate uh, not just the investment landscape, but to maintain stability and to be able to continue and finish that vision 2030 that you talked about? Well, I think since you brought up the elephant, the overwhelming thoughts that I have and that I'm sure everybody in this room has is sympathy with the innocent victims that are uh, suffering, dying, losing loved ones as a result of these uh, conflicts. And I think that overshadows everything else. But for their good and for the good of humanity, we have to keep the compass focused on uh, prosperity of our people uh, as countries, as regions, as we talked uh, just now, but indeed uh, for, uh, for humanity. Uh, so, uh, you know, the focus is addressing uh, all of the risks and ills that have been uh, discussed by building resilient economies. And I can tell you that in Saudi Arabia, it is a fact that we live in uh, a region that has had its share of conflicts and risks over uh, the last many, many decades. Uh, and we have the wisdom of uh, our leadership that has built resilience uh, in everything about Saudi Arabia, whether it is security, economy, our fiscal position, our financial policies, uh, our supply chain. So we have seen shock after shock globally and regionally pass through and it does impact us, uh, but a uh, lot less than those uh, unprepared uh, nations uh, and economies. So we're going to uh, build on that resilience that we have. We're going to turn challenges into opportunities, uh, whether it's the macro trends we started the session with or the specific issues that will emerge uh, out of the conflicts in Europe, in the Middle East, uh, elsewhere uh, in the world. And we have to do it by investing in our people. I think our most important resource, after all, is not going to be our important oil resources or natural resources and the critical materials that are available, or even our location. It's our people. So investing in our youth investing in entrepreneurship, innovation, technology, and finding solutions for that. And I think just as important, investing in partnerships with 
friendly nations, uh, many companies that have their trust in Saudi Arabia that come back to the kingdom. Every opportunity that, that we have, not only to attend global gatherings like the FII, but indeed to put their money where their mouth is and invest. And if I had more time, I would tell you great news about how FDI is turning up in Saudi Arabia year after year, and we're moving as a top 10 FDI attraction nation. With the goal to be a top 10 uh, economy we're, as well. We're getting there, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? You can look at the world in a very different way with what's been thrown at governments and the private sector over the last three years. Uh, the fact that we're as stable as we are today, despite conflict, uh, says quite a bit about uh, collaboration and cooperation because it could be much worse in, in different times. Uh, thanks for convening the panel. I appreciate the invitation. Give a nice round of applause for all our participants. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.